God is telling the people, you have left your first love because you're being stingy with what you have. You're heaping unto yourself. You're trying to make sure you're blessed and you stay blessed. Well, guess what? You cannot do with the little you're trying to hold back more than what God has holding in heaven. Good evening and greetings and blessings to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to I want to thank you again and again and again for joining us for another segment of our Bible study. And it gives me joy to be able to walk with you through God's word and to grow with you. I'll never be in a position where I, I'm 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 a hundred percent perfect in my understanding of the word. I'll never be to a place where I'm so far ahead of you that I could just stop growing and sit back and wait for you to grow so we can start walking again. I want to admit to you that while I'm teaching, I'm also learning and I'm glad that I'm able to learn with you. So without further ado, I want to go right into our word today and I want to invite you to join me in the book of Malachi. As we continue to deal with walking in the supernatural, in other words, walking with God and seeing God's power and work in our lives, beginning from the transformation of the believer to the transformation of others that are around us. And even after that, God will pour out blessings and miracles healings and everything else that God does in our lives as we walk with him. Malachi chapter number three. Now to bring you up to Malachi chapter number three, let me just sum up what's going on in Malachi chapter number two so that you can understand what he's saying in chapter number three, particularly verse number three. In Malachi chapter number two, we deal with several things that God implicates the sons of Levi and the people of Judah uh, or the house of Israel concerning. The sons of Levi are no longer giving God's name the glory. They're no longer teaching people the fear of the Lord. Their hearts uh, are gone astray and they're leading the hearts of the people to go astray. Uh, they have caused the people to no longer fear God. And as a result, the people are dealing treacherously with one another. As the Bible says that we become heady and high minded, I believe, and we become lovers of ourselves. All right. And the love of many will wax cold. This is what's happening here in the scripture, in Malachi chapter number two. But it begins with leadership that fails to teach the, the fear of the Lord. Okay. And then they begin to deal treacherously, the people of Judah, uh, with their spouses. They no longer see marriage as sacred. So because it's become sort of a, a hedonistic culture, a, a self-centered culture, one in which the people only want what's good for them rather than to try to look out for the needs of other because this has happened they longer see marriage as a sacred union they're not even trying to keep it together they look at their spouse you don't look good enough for me i'm gonna give you a divorce and then they begin to take on pagan women all right and they bring these pagan women in and it's further spoiling society okay and and then uh, not only that but they're still going through their motions of uh, 
if you will, church. They're still bringing offerings. They're still bringing lambs and things for the priests to give. And they're even crying to God, literally weeping on the altar, but they're not repenting. How many of us are stuck today in the same situation? We've got religion. We've got belief. So we say we have faith. And we even feel bad about the stuff that we're doing and we cry and we ask God for forgiveness over and over and over. But yet we don't have a heart to turn away from sin. We're trying to embrace God and embrace sin all at the same time. And just hope that God will forgive us. Paul said in Romans chapter number six, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. People of God, we must be repentant. And this is what we're dealing with in the house of Judah, that even though they have a form of religion, they're still unrepentant. OK, and then on top of that, the evildoers still expect God to bless them. That's what we find out at the end of chapter number two of Malachi, that they're evildoers. They're still looking for God to bless them. All right. And they don't even fear him as the righteous judge anymore. They're, they're even they're even asking and and they're asking in our heart. Well, people keep on saying God's going to judge us. When is he going to do it? We got our temple back. We got our worship back. All right. So why should we be judged? They're continuing in evil, expecting God to bless them. And God tells them they're cursed with a curse. Malachi three. Uh, verse one through 10, behold, I'll send my messenger. And he shall prepare the way before me and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide at the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like full of soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right. And fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even the days of your fathers ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I'll return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein or how shall we return? He turns around and asks a question. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offering? You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Try God. Prove God. Prove him to be a liar. If you do what he says do, you'll see what he says he'll do. He says, I will open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't even have room to receive it. I simply want to talk to you for a few minutes about living the blessed life. Living the blessed life. As I said in Malachi chapter number two, the people's hearts have strayed away from God. And it's not uh, entirely because of the Levites, but partially. And, uh, and there's a lot of weight on the fact that the leaders, the spiritual leaders among the people of Israel are no longer encouraging the fear of the Lord. Or the fear of the Lord concerning keeping his ordinances. The people are satisfied with the fact that 
They are Abraham's seed. And you see this mentality still in the Pharisees when we cross over into the New Testament. And they are trusting that because they're Abraham's seed, that the blessings of God rest upon their lives, that they have that God has no right to punish them, that God has no right to take away from them that which he has blessed them with. And they trust their labor. They trust in the things that they have done to be their saving grace. But I want to show you another scripture that shows us why you cannot trust in your works to be your saving grace. Revelations chapter number two, verses one through five. Jesus tells the church of Ephesus that I know your works. I know your labor. You're laboring to the end. You hate when people do evil. It really pricks your heart. You're even trying those false apostles. You're trying the spirits to see whether they be of God. You really are taking some concern concerning who is teaching you. You have some zeal about yourself concerning uh, what's right and what's wrong. And you're laboring and you're not even fainting. But Jesus tells the church of Ephesus, I still have something against you. You've left your first love. You left your first love. You're doing things, but you're trusting the things that you do to be your saving grace. In actuality, you're trusting your labor as God. Because when it's God who you should be seeking approval from, you're actually getting your approval from the works. Let me tell you what Warren Wiersbe says. Labor is no substitute for love. Neither is purity a substitute for passion. Labor is no substitute for love. Purity is no substitute for passion. So they left their love, that, that first love, because they trust the labor. But now they don't have love for God. And then when you trust in your labor, you begin to trust in yourself. You begin to have confidence in yourself because of the things that you've done. And when that happens, you stop loving other people as well. You, you have made your religion your God and not God himself. We, we look at it in terms of this is what a Christian ought to do. So I'm going to do what a Christian does. And God ought to, he ought to see me doing it. And God ought to reward me because I'm doing the stuff. But who's truly seeking God's will? See, these people are doing things, but they're cursed because they're not seeking God himself. This is why that they are able to deal with one another treacherously. Why men become lovers of themselves, high-minded, heady. And, and, and the love of many shall wax cold because we're self-centered now. We think we've got what we need because, well, we're doing what a Christian's supposed to do. But the Bible says, in everything we do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. Well, when you're just doing what a Christian ought to do, you're doing it unto your religion, uh, unto that thought process. But when you're doing it unto God, you're seeking him first. Lord, what must I do today? Lord, who do I need to talk to today? What do I need to give today? Lord, what is your will? See, God is God, right? It's God who we ought to be seeking approval from. This is why a true believer is able to still do for someone that hates him or her. Because we know that it's not about me doing it, but it's about me pleasing God. I want to please God first and foremost. And Judah had left this mentality behind. All right. You see, by the time you get to verse number eight, that it's all about them. Because they're robbing God. God says, return to me. And, and, and Israel says, how are we going to return to you? We never left you. God says, you did leave me because you stopped tithing. You stop bringing offering. You, you, you have robbed me. In verse number nine, he says, not only have you robbed me, you've robbed the whole nation. 
So we see two detachments here. The person who is the hero, the individual, is detached from God and is detached from his brothers and sisters. It's detached from those who are around him or her. All right. God says, you robbed me. Not only have you robbed me, you robbed the whole nation. Well, John tells us uh, um, that you cannot love God who you see, who, you, who you've never seen, and yet you hate your brother. Who you say, see every day. I believe it's John. It could be James. I could be mistaken. It, it just That scripture just came in my spirit. But it says, how can you love God whom you never seen and hate your brother who you see every day? You're a liar. The truth is not in you. Right? So when this individual or these individuals who are no longer tithing and, off, and giving the offering, when they hold back from God. They're holding back from God because this is God's ordinance. They're holding back from the nation because God meant for it to be a blessing to the people. So for those who say, I ain't giving my money to that man, you, you, you're deceiving yourself because when we bring our tithes and our offerings, we're bringing them to God. All right, this is not about fulfilling a man-made ordinance. This is about giving unto the Lord. And when you bring to the storehouse, the storehouse has what we need when you're in need, when your brother or sister in need, when whoever is in need. When we bring to the storehouse, we're blessing the nation. God is telling the people, you have left your first love because you're being stingy with what you have. You're heaping unto yourself. You're trying to make sure you're blessed and you stay blessed. Well, guess what? You cannot do with the little you're trying to hold back more than what God has holding in heaven. He says, try me. If you bring what you're supposed to bring, I'm going to give you more than you can handle. Mm. Bring what you're supposed to bring. You trying to hold on to $20? That $20 ain't going to be Half of what I can give you. Prove God. He's a God of his word. If you do what God tells you to do, God will open up the windows. But it's not about giving so I can receive. God is saying that your giving is directly attached to your relationship with me and your relationship with the nation around you. Because when you give, you become selfless. When you keep, you become selfish. And when you're selfish, you can't be a blessing to nobody. God wants us to be in a position where we are not selfish, that we're humble, that we are able to give and not even ask to get it back. When you come to a place where you're able to give generously and you don't look for it back like Jesus told us to do, then you really truly become Christ-like. And when your heart comes to that place, my goodness, the power of God is already upon you by giving you that kind of heart. But when you do, God opens up windows of heaven and pours out blessing. But, but check this out. We always look for blessing in that scripture to be in the form of money. I want to let you know that Blessing ain't always about money. Favor is priceless. You can put a value on dollars, but you can't put a value on favor. Because of favor, some people, and even myself, have gotten out of paying bills that you thought you needed money for. Some people have gotten positions that they're not qualified for. With favor, some people have built networks that only people who are rich would usually have. You, you, you know billionaires on a first name basis and whatever you need, they'll give it to you. That's what favor would do, but not just favor, but God will bless you with healing where you didn't think you needed healing. He'll bless you to be a blessing to somebody else. I mean, the blessings are limitless. He didn't tell you that he'll give you a specific blessing. He says that I will 
open up the windows of heaven and pour you out blessing that there should not be room to receive it. Whatever you need, God is able to do, I say it so much, exceedingly and abundantly above all you can ask or think. Don't you think that's living the blessed life? I mean, if you truly want to live the blessed life, learn how to let go of what you're being so stingy with. And when you're able to let go, you can open up your heart. Okay? That's, that's really what living the blessed life is about. And this is what God is trying to get over to his children here in Malachi chapter number three. You hate each other because you're so selfish. You're so stingy. You don't even give like you're supposed to give. And now you want to keep everything for yourself. And the nation around you is crumbling morally, crumbling materially, while you're trying to keep for yourself. You're trying to hold on to a steak plate on a sinking ship. You're trying to hold on to a hundred dollar bill and you're on a sinking ship in the middle of the ocean. You can't spend a hundred dollar bill when you're drowned. This is what God is telling us. We have to open up our hearts. When we open up our hearts and let him in, we're able to love others the way we're supposed to love others. And if we can love others the way we should love others, then we can love God. Jesus simplified all the commandments by giving us two to follow. That you love God, the Lord thy God, with all your heart, mind, and strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. You can't do that if you're stubborn and stingy and hedonistic and you only want for you. You got to open up your heart and begin to give that others may be blessed. And God will, he promises, he will open the windows of heaven and make sure you're so blessed. You don't have room to maintain it, to contain it. And what you do with that is you continue to give. And I guarantee you that window it will remain open in heaven and you'll see the supernatural power of God at work in your life. The blessed life. Simple lesson. I want to thank you again for joining us. Lord is willing. We hope to see you on next week. Remember, open up your heart. Let him in by letting stuff out. God bless. <laughs>